Alrighty, I've got a display of some portable televisions ranging from 1977, 80, 82, 82, um, 84. I think this is an 84. Uh, I don't see a date on that one. 85. So they, uh, Panasonic, these are all Panasonics back here, did uh, work really hard to create the Travel Vision series, and uh, I've got one of each of those series. I don't believe I've missed one. This is the earliest one, a little difficult to get a hold of, and I've actually done a video on this, YouTube video on this model, And uh, but I'm not here to show the Panasonics other than just to compare them with the English-made Sinclair, the Sinclair. This has been quite the challenge for me. I own a few of these Sinclairs and I've used them for spare parts to try to get, these are the parts for the inter part of the television. The Sinclair, made in England, used a two inch picture tube. And they claimed that it was the world's smallest picture tube, but you can clearly see this is a Panasonic picture tube here and it's an inch and a half. And you can clearly see they didn't make the world's smallest picture tube. And in another video that I plan to produce in a few months, I have a picture tube that's about this big. It's uh, about three quarters of an inch, half of this size. And uh, I'm gonna play, and I think it's color. I don't remember if it's color or not. But all of these are black and white sets. And um, the Sinclair, presented quite a challenge getting uh, getting it repaired. And I'll go into some of the reasons technically why it was such a difficult uh, repair and the hopes that I can provide some assistance with some other technicians. So part of this uh, video, the second part of this video will go into the nitty gritty of the circuit boards and some of the components that you'll have to replace or that are probably suspect on the uh, Sinclair Microvision. So let's take a look at the Sinclair Microvision. We've got a fly over here. I don't think he can find the airport. The, uh, the Microvision MTV-1, MTV-1 Sinclair, um, has internal NICAD batteries. Here's a power board and a tuner board. These are the tuner modules. These are brand new NICAD uh, batteries that I put on this board in the repair. You can see there's a speaker um, on this, so it's it's a uh, bridge over to the uh, tuner. There's the tuning control and uh, the actual tuner. And I'm not even sure this might be an IF amplifier circuit right here, but you can see it's covered with uh, copper foil. The uh, NICADs, internal NICADs, required a technician to be able to replace them. And in most cases, the NICADs that were now currently in these uh, Sinclairs are in pretty bad shape. This particular model, these NICADs that I pulled out of the, out of the TV were in great shape considering their age. Um, a couple of the sets that I have for parts, these batteries had basically exploded and spilled acid all over the circuit board. In fact, this might have been one of those boards. You can see the corrosion on the circuit board from the acid from those batteries. This one's in fairly good condition, but some of them are completely eaten. The traces are completely eaten up which makes it very difficult to repair. This is the, uh, well, before we get into the technical side of things, let's just watch some TV. I've got channel 12 or 13 playing right now uh, on the uh, transmitter. So let's uh, get our turn the light off over here. Sure is. Not very well. I really like pictures with kissing in them. Would you know if I can 
something else is fun to do. I think I've got a channel eight here. Let's tune down. Dr. Charles, even by your standards, this is a psychopath. How much longer am I going to be worried about Arthur Fleckenheimer? You gotta learn to relax, Thomas. So that's channel eight. And I got channel twelve tuned in right now watching Andy Griffith. And if I I've got a switch over here. Um, let's go back over here to channel eight. So what's the skinny Johnny? You were right, Mr. Machado. And I've got Roku hooked up to it. I've got a DVD player hooked up to it, which is not playing right now, so if I blank. But there's Roku. And uh, another tuner hooked up. So I can watch a lot of TV on these. Okay. So, anyway, took a while to get this Sinclair running. And uh, I'm proud to say that I finally did get it to work. Um, pretty methodical. One of the, the claims of fame of the uh, Sinclair was that this TV will work anywhere in the world. These Panasonics, uh, some of these Panasonics have a European and Asian setting, and some of them do not. This model does not have an Asian and UH, uh, Asian uh, excuse me, Asian and European setting. This model does not. Let's see, one of these is called a Travel Vision. Um, no, does not. Let's see if this one does. This one does. This will play in Europe, Europe or in the UK or the US. So this particular model was designed to be traveled uh, all over the world. And... Uh, even has a simulated leather sticker right there. Anyway, this is a nice little set. Let's see if this one has any. No, this is a US only. So I've got a couple more of these, a couple of duplicates that I bought for spare parts. But um, that's the Sinclair Microvision MTV1. And uh, so let's just, for fun, let's just fire these up. Um, <laughs> color. I forgot. This is a color set. Pretty nice screen. New Pronamel Mineral Boost helps protect teeth against everyday acids. Pronamel boosts enamel's natural absorption of calcium and phosphate, helping keep teeth. Get the right antenna adjustment there. there we go. So that's the uh, Panasonic color. Um, and we've got the earliest model, the TV, or TY, no, uh, TR1, TR001, and this is a hard one to find on eBay. It's got a little bit of a fold-over issue on the, uh, video. But nice picture and good audio. Swing by. And let's just try uh, let's just try this one. It's got the enlarged screen enlarger. All right. So just about it make gives you fifty percent more larger screen. All right. So anyway, these are the Pan Panasonic series. Scott Farron on the hurt line. Spanish guy comes by after I get off break. I asked for 14F. He says his name is Joe. 
Alex is out for us, told me to send him up. Did it sound like she was expecting him? Uh, she kind of hesitated when I told her who it was. How long was he up there? Well, I don't even remember him coming back down. Is there a service entrance? No. So the, missed... the jewel of the collection is the Sinclair, since they're so hard to find. And when you find them, they're not going to work. No way are they going to work. I can't imagine what this thing is worth now since it's working, what it would be worth. All of this fits into one of these shells. And you've got the uh, power and tuning board. You've got the uh, horizontal width and vertical width. You've got the audio board. You've got the uh, IF board. You've got the uh, high voltage and uh, switchboard. Got the picture tube. We've got the batteries. The antenna. Here's the VHF antenna. Here's the UHF antenna. All of that. The face plate and the rear plate. All of that fits in to this package so it's pretty packed in there pretty tight all that has to fit in there nicely and so i uh, wanted you to see it in all of its uh, individual components okay let's take a look at a couple of things here let me find a pointer and uh, i want to point out a couple of things that were problematic with the uh, Sinclair MTV-1. The high voltage section is op operates much like the current television circuits where the horizontal output creates has an oscillator and a transformer. And the transformer takes the low voltages and boosts them to high voltages. In this case, there is just a tiny little oscillator circuit right here. There's a transistor that you can see is missing. I pulled it out and put it in this set or in one of these other sets that was short. Uh, the other one was shorted. So I used this, re re this re transistor as a replacement. But these two transistors create an oscillator with the caps and, and uh, tie into one of the uh, windings of this little teensy little transformer right here and create a number of different voltages. Creates a 2000 volt power for the picture tube. It creates an 800 volt circuit for the picture tube. It creates two 300 volt uh, voltages for deflection, horizontal and vertical. It creates a 45 volt circuit, which feeds some of the circuits and then transfers over into the tuner board and the tuner board uses the 30 to 40 volt range to tune channels and all of that is produced by these five volts or four and a half volt batteries so i guess it would be six volts of of uh, well these are 1.2 so that's um 4.6 4.5 5 volts somewhere in that range depending on the charge of the batteries there's a chip here that's a four-point, uh, four-part chip that does a lot of control and logic. There are the high-voltage capacitors here for the uh, deflection circuits. And then there are these pots right here that are user control, vertical, horizontal, contrast, and brightness. And then there are some pots down inside, you can see here, that are serviceable when the set is taken apart, which increases the... Um, uh, amplifier, amplifier horizontal and vertical amplifiers there's an adjustment here right here for the 5 volt supply for the picture tube and there's a 45 volt pot right here that adjusts the 45 volt negative 45 volts there's a little tiny board that sits right here and these circuits are the horizontal width and the vertical width and I pulled this one out because one of these pots is bad and I just swapped this board out and put it in this set over here to get it to work correctly. You can see the picture tube has multiple pins. And um, it's a beautiful picture tube made in Germany. Interesting. And the set itself is 
made in England from the Sinclair company. One of the challenges that I was faced with was with the schematic that I got online. And the only schematic I could find online was very poor quality. And so I, I, I learned and studied a lot about the uh, TV because there's all kinds of instructions and circuit explanations. But the schematic itself was very difficult to read. And you can see the component names and the values in some cases are readable. But then you get over here and you look and you can't read the values at all. So it's a real problem. It was a real challenge for me to be able to troubleshoot without proper values. Most of this circuit here was bad. There was a couple of transistors bad in, a, in one of these circuits that produces this little transformer, produces the high voltages. So um, I hope that some of the you technicians out there that are working on these, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to, to try to answer them. Can't, can't promise you that I will. I'm certainly not an expert on it. But I do have a little more experience now. It was always a lot of fun because this section right here is all the high voltage. You can see the high voltage capacitors and the diodes that rectify the high frequency uh, AC. And you, I was constantly touching these and getting shocked. So that 2,000 volts will give you a zap even though it's just running off a 5-volt power supply. Low current but it was enough for me to jump every time. And actually I dropped this circuit board on the floor a couple of times from getting shocked. So uh, that was always a lot of fun working with television circuits. So I wanted to show you a couple of the other discoveries that I made along the way in, in reinstalling batteries, installing new batteries. The most of the power boards, the circuitry here was damaged let me show you another one without the batteries here we go you can see the corrosion and the the trace that almost every one of these units uh i discovered that this terminal this battery terminal right here which is this battery right here this terminal has a the only power off this is no bottom connection goes around here and goes around and comes into the top of the tuner and I'll show you where uh, it's connected that if that gets if that trace is corroded and broken and every one that I had is this is corroded through and won't pass current through here I had to run a jumper so you need to be aware that you're going to need probably put a jumper and that red wire right there comes to that point, comes over, over the top, and connects to the second terminal. So there's a one, two, three, four, connects to the second terminal right there. And that's the main power to the whole set. So if you don't have, if you've got a set that's completely dead after replacing the batteries, that's one thing you need to look at. Second thing you need to look at, which is not immediately obvious, is the fuse. And if you'll see, there's a fusible link right there. This is a little heavier link than most sets. Uh, I put a much finer one on a couple of the other sets. See if I can find it there. Yeah, that one's missing a link. It burned and popped. So you need that fusible link on there in order for the set to work. And so that's when you're assembling the set, sometimes you'll short things and that'll be the first thing to pop. Another issue that I ran into was these bird connectors. And these are notorious for getting corroded from the batteries. And they just, the pins on the other half of the bird connection um, as you can see here, these pins plug into these sockets. And if these sockets are corroded, you're not going to get a, obviously you're not going to get a, uh, any audio. In this case, you won't get any audio. Another thing about the audio board, I noticed that a couple of the sets didn't have audio, have very weak audio. 
and so you have to replace these filter caps and you get your audio back. I also discovered that one set had a bad bad audio after rebuilding the soundboard, the the volume control was open. So thankfully I had another control over here from another set and so I salvaged took that volume control off and put replaced it with a working volume control. So that's the uh, audio board. The IF board, I had not done anything with them. I had a, a working IF board, so I didn't have to uh, tinker with any of them to get them aligned. And I have not, of course, changed any alignment on the set. I didn't have any reason to. I noticed that a couple of mine had been, chips had been replaced on some of the boards. So apparently a technician had been into it before and uh, replaced some components. Let's see, there's another issue that cropped up and that is this capacitor right here on a couple of the sets. This capacitor is bad, it's cracked and corroded, probably, probably from batteries. It's a 100 peak uh, nanofarad 100 nanofarad capacitor and so that's a 104 i believe isn't that right 104 so yes so the uh yeah 100 nanofarad and so you'll have to replace that i i uh i'm not sure it's a critical component to the actual working of the set but it definitely was there for a reason so i put it back okay then if you don't have any audio after assembling the set, there's another area that's a very common problem, and that is the ear the earphone. So the power, the audio comes off of this board here and finds its way back here to the earphone jack. And if these terminals are broken or corroded, as they are on several of the circuit boards, let's see if I can find it. Um, yes. This, uh, on one of my circuit boards, these audio paths right here, you remember this, this circuit board is, this circuit path is for the uh, five volts. And then these two leads go back up into and uh, around here and into the, come up, I think come up back up through to the uh, um, audio board connections. If they're open, you will not have any, if there's any problem with the traces or if this little jack inside the um, little switch inside the earphone jack is open, let me get it turned around here. I'm trying to get it turned around upside down. If that if that circuit is open, you won't have any audio. Um, what I would suggest is if you're not going to use the earphone jack and you don't care about keeping your TV original, I would. Uh, I would just short these two leads right here. Just make sure you're not shorting it to the five volt line. That you're just connecting these two con these two circuit paths together. Because without this being bypassed, and if this is open, you won't get any sound through the speaker. And then, of course, uh, uh, generally, uh, you're going to find as you p piddle with this unit, you take it apart and put it together. These leads on the speaker, or really any of the leads, tend to break underneath the insulation. So you're fiddling around, and the insulation is holding the whole thing together, but there's no cotton, there's no electrical connection. So you have to be really, really careful in handling all of this. And I'm mangling it around here like uh, a bull in a china shop, but. If I were working with this set to try to get this particular board to work again, I would be very careful with allowing this thing to be dangling around like that, pulling on the wires. Uh, let's see. Another thing that you're going to discover is that the antenna connections have to be connected in the right place. On this board, just pay attention. On this board, you can see where the two leads are connected. You have to make sure you know that those, where they go back, because they'll break off, because it's dangling, and it has the, uh, well, where'd it go? Uh, here it is. It has this uh, antenna connector right here, hanging off of those two wires. 
Okay, then there was another interesting find. Okay. If you'll notice, this power board, remember this is tuner and the power board, batteries and all that. If you'll notice, this space right here. And on this board, these are the same boards. On this board, there's a little resistor network. Three resistors right there. And they come back, see them coming back to where the antennas connect. And what happens is they came in and did this resistor network for a, a, a antenna connection. And then these two wires right here, this purple and this brown wire, connect to the back plate. And there's two metal terminals right here and here on the back plate for the external antenna. And that's where these two wires end up. These two wires end up going to the external antenna connection. So if, uh, if your unit doesn't have this little resistor network, you can either create one or just leave it off. I'm not sure it's gonna be that big of a deal. 20 years ago, when we had analog television all over the place, it would have been a different story, but I sure wouldn't go to the trouble of adding that. But that definitely was a factory add-on Apparently there was an impedance matching issue with the external antenna. And so they created that resistor network right there to do an impedance matching to not load down the, um, probably uh, this is not 75 ohms impedance. And it's probably much, much higher than that because a whip antenna is typically much higher than 75 ohms. And these wires go to this whip antenna so what they did was, not only did they go to the whip antenna for high impedance, uh, probably 700, several hundred ohms high impedance, and then they went back here to the little 56 ohm network and went to the back terminal so that you could hook a 75 ohm antenna. But it wouldn't, it would have been much lower impedance than the whip antenna. So that's what that, that's what that's all about. And that was an add-on, apparently an afterthought that the uh, Sinclair company decided to uh, add to the circuit. Let's see, what else? Uh, I guess I didn't describe, explain this front panel, but it might be of, of use to you. Notice that there's a VH1, a VHF, and a UHF uh, uh, setting. There's the Euro, the UK, and the USA setting. And then there's a VHF 1 and 3 so the VHF1 frequency goes from channel 2 up to channel 6. And then the, cha the VHF channel 3 goes from 7 to 13. So they split the VHF channel up into two bands. These little buttons here are just log buttons. So once you get figure out where your uh, favorite channels are, you can slide those little log buttons up to like this one. I'm going to move to channel 13 right there. So now I know channel 13 is uh, is where I want to go. And then I can remember I had channel 8 on the other one, so I could move this one up to channel 8 thereabouts. So that's all those are. Those are just log pins so that you can identify stations, uh, your favorite stations, more quickly rather than hunting around for them. One set that I had had an actual clear plastic cover over the picture tube. Now this set didn't have that. I'm touching the actual glass face of the picture tube. Let's see, anything else? Really, um, the instructions on how to disassemble this are helpful, and those are available online if you find the right uh, place. I had to search for a while. The, the unit, I think I mentioned this earlier, the unit does have uh, 12 and 6 volt input. As you can see from this plate, this plate actually had the decal still on it. See that DC in 12 and 6? But this one, the DC in uh, labeling is just about gone. So the top one, let me get it turned around here. Oh, the top one is 12 volts, and then you can slide this up here to, un to cover up the 12 volt and plug in the 6 volt. And uh, as far as I can tell, both the 12 and the 6 will charge the batteries. Um, if you turn the TV off and have it plugged in to the adapter, it will charge the batteries. Okay. 
There's your ear plug. Oh, there's your ear plug that we were our phone jack, and there's the antenna connectors, the external antenna connectors. And by the way, huh? This bar is shorting those two leads. You see that? So that's not good. I don't want to short those two leads. Uh, so I need to run those screws back down in their sockets, get them off of that UHF antenna. I'm sure that affects the uh, the reception. The antenna pulls straight out as part of the disassembly process. That took me a while to figure out. It just pulls straight out. It's a little tight, but it will come out. And um, I've got several extra antennas now. So that's uh, about all I can share with you. It did not come with a stand, which is peculiar because sitting on a table, you know, you're looking at it from this angle and all of these Panasonics have, other than the, uh, the TR001, all of the Panasonics do have a, 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 a stand that holds it up off of the table so you can view it. Kind of an interesting thing that the Brits didn't uh, add that to their to their microvision. You can find some pretty cool ads on this on uh, eBay and on the internet that that uh, promote this television, the Sinclair MTV One. Date of manufacture. 1978. I think they started producing them in 1977. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, short video on the Sinclair Microvision MTV-1. This is a beautiful little TV and pretty hefty little box and uh, it really does a nice job. Sergeant?